Good morning, folks. Glad to see you people here this morning. I'm Chaplain Dan. I'm the chaplain of this, uh, over this uh, community service. Uh, we're glad to have uh, people here this morning uh, worshiping with us today. I want to give just a few announcements you know, uh, before we open up in prayer and then we begin to sing to the Lord. First of all, remember our Bible study uh, on uh, 1900 on Tuesday evenings. Dinner is provided. We had a good group of people come out for that, around 10 folks. Uh, come to that on Tuesday night. So if you want to be a part of that, we're studying relational wisdom and study guides and all kinds of different things that are involved with that study. We'd love to have you. You can jump in anywhere with that. Also, if you're going through grief, um, we have a grief group that, that, that meets and grief can be associated to the loss of a loved one, to the loss of a life, um, to the loss of a, of a relationship, even uh, some folks that are thinking of being part of the group that are just processing a tough childhood that they had growing up and how to deal with those things. That's at 1700 on Tuesdays. And so it's a, a, a slow a start to that group. In fact, no one showed up the first week, uh, but we'll keep uh, uh, promoting it to see uh, how it goes going forward. Um, besides that, our seven churches trip filled up within probably about an hour to two hours after the advertisement went out. And so we're thankful for those that responded so quickly. And um, uh, we look forward to that trip coming up in uh, next weekend. Is that right? Yes, next weekend. Uh, Chaplain Gonzalez will be preaching for me as I'm the POC for that service. Then lastly, uh, keep in mind our Easter services and Easter celebration are coming up in April. April 17th is Easter Sunday. We have Baptism Sunday that Sunday also. So if you want to follow the Lord in Believer's Baptism, talk to me after the service as uh, we'll, uh, we have uh, someone who's planning on following the Lord in baptism that day, you can jump in with them uh, if the Lord is leading you to do that. If you've never done so. And lastly, we're going to pray here, but I want to pray specifically of, um, for not just our service, but specifically for our worship team. Um, we're thankful we added a new drummer, although he is homesick this morning with some stomach issues. But we are praying, asking God to send us some vocalists and maybe a bass guitar player and uh, different things. So we need uh, musicians to come forward, specifically singers. And so uh, that's something I'm asking you to pray for throughout the week. And of course, join me with it this morning. So let's stand together and let's pray to the Lord and ask God to bless our service, but specifically ask him to send forth laborers. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just lift our hearts and our minds towards you, Lord. We do pray for this service specifically. Uh, God, we, we pray that we're thankful that we have the opportunity to hold service, that we have the freedom and the rights given to us in our Constitution to worship as we see freely. Uh, but Lord, we do pray that you will send forth laborers into the harvest. Lord, we, we need uh, people who have a heart for worship, a heart for praising you with their given talents, whether that's uh, in an instrument or through singing, Lord, I pray that you will connect us with those people that are maybe PCS and, and new to our base, send them our way, and help us to be able to integrate them into the worship team. Lord, uh, we pray for our service today, and God, we pray for um, the preaching, uh, the giving of God's people, um, the singing uh, of, of praise and worship songs to you. I pray that you'll be honored and glorified. God, we pray lastly for the situation in Ukraine. God, we pray for Ukrainians, uh, that, that uh, you would protect those innocent civilians that are caught in the midst of this uh, political tensions that have, have risen uh, between, the, between the West and, and uh, Russia. And God, I pray that you just bring peace and give wisdom to leadership um, that are involved all across this wide spectrum. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing to the Lord this morning. You can remain standing as we lift our voices to Him.
through every this time we're going to worship the Lord through our giving. Uh, remember, tithes and offerings can be given physically, or as some of you do, you can give electronically our code directly uh, to our giving link. Eptectiva giving link uh, is on the back door as you leave. It's marked Protestant. Uh, you just scan that with your phone. Uh, but I'll pray for our giving, and our ushers at that time will come forward and collect our offering. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for how you give to us so uh, abundantly and you take care of our needs. We're thankful uh, that we are in one of the most prosperous nations in the history of the world and uh, we, are, we exist with such abundance financially, Lord. Um, when we look at the big picture around the globe, we are truly blessed by the best. And so, Lord, we praise you for that. But, Lord, in a greater way than the physical blessings that you've given to us, you've given us an ultimate spiritual blessing through your Son who paid our debt in full on that cross when he laid down our lives for our sins so that we could be called children of God. What an unspeakable gift. Lord, I pray that our finances will reflect our thanksgiving that we have for your goodness. 
that we will faithfully worship you uh, with our tithes and with our offerings, whether we give here in our chapel community to our churches back home. Uh, but Lord, help us to be faithful in giving back to you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated as our ushers come to receive our offering. I invite you to sing along with us as we as we receive our offering. We'll be in the book of Philippians this morning. Philippians chapter 4 is kind of our foundational verses that we've been looking at, although we'll be looking at Acts chapter 16 a little bit and Philippians chapter 1 also, but we'll start off in Philippians chapter 4 in just a moment. 
So we finish off our series on anxiety. So we've been talking about this, something that seemingly plagues, um, plagues people uh, today. And I would say definitely, you know, I've said this all along, in the military career, in the profession of arms, you're kind of in a culture of anxiety, right? You're anxious about where you're going next, you're anxious about who you're going to work with, you're anxious about deployments, you're anxious, you're anxious about war. Uh, if you're a younger person, then you have a lot of decisions set before you, right? You've got to choose whether you're going to stay in the military, maybe even get out, go back to school, maybe you're going to pick up a trade, do something along those lines. If you're anxious about who you're going to date, who you're going to marry, uh, how you're going to make money, how you're going to do all these different things. And so uh, we are blessed to have all the opportunities that we have, but oftentimes with those opportunities comes anxiety with it because of the everything that's coming at us. We live in a hyper news saturated culture. I, if I have addictions, one of the addictions that I would say I have is I'm addicted to news media. I don't know if that's a problem you have. Maybe you can identify with it. Sometimes I have to take a fast uh, from podcasts or talk radio. I remember one time I was listening to talk radio and this was right around election season, so everybody was stressed and you know people were having meltdowns and I was driving across base and I had either a podcast or talk radio or something playing on in my, my vehicle and I just all of a sudden realized that I was at the edge of rage, you know, like my heart was pounding, my blood pressure was up and I just said, what am I doing to myself? And I had to turn that stuff off and I quickly went to something mindless like sports radio uh, or uh, uh, something else, or just quiet, you know, uh, solitude. We live in this day and age where all this stuff comes at us, and I think because of it, one of the results of it is anxiety that we have in our lives. And I've been open, I've been honest with you this morning, although I don't think anxiety is a crippling uh, type of problem that I face, and maybe some of you face in a greater way, I've had minor personal struggles with anxiety in my life, panic feelings, issues of trying to breathe, being able to calm down my mind and just rest. When we come to Paul here in Philippians chapter 4, we pick up a guy who if he had, a, had a really an argument to be anxious, it should have been Paul himself, because if you don't know anything about the ancient world, one of the truths is they weren't very kind to prisoners. Even if you look how Christ was put to death, Paul could have surmised that quite frankly, if the Romans were crucifying Christ, why wouldn't they crucify him, one of his followers and advocates? So he knew that quite possibly his death could be gruesome and it could be coming his way. Yet Paul penned the book of Philippians to the church of Philippi while he was imprisoned. And because Paul, I, I imagine, because Paul... Uh, was a prisoner of high interest who had escaped imprisonment before, not of his own doing, but of God's work. Uh, he was not just in a simple cell behind lock and key, but he was literally chained to a prison guard during his imprisonment. That doesn't sound very fun to me. I don't know how it sounds to you, but I can imagine that he was filled with discouragement. I can imagine that he was filled with fear. I can imagine that he was filled with worry. I can imagine that he was filled with anxiety. Yet in the context of his imprisonment, with that guard chained to his side, with his possible pending execution coming his way, Paul pens these words in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Excuse me, when I hear those verses, I always, my mind goes back to Sunday school. I don't know if any of you sang these words when you were growing up. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Maybe it was just me, all right? So one, one person shook their head. All right, you and I, we sang that growing up. And you do it in a round. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. I'm not going to make you sing it this morning. But I remember singing that song as a kid. It's a fun song to sing. It's great on a, on a magnet in the refrigerator or a coffee cup that you buy your grandma or you put on a nice gift on, a, on maybe a Mother's Day card or something along those ways, uh, th those lines, excuse me, because it's easy to quote to someone. It's nice to see 
embroidered on a pillow or something. But it's much harder to receive those words in the midst of a trial or a crisis. I mean, when you just got hit with some bad news and you're upset. When you walk out, you're running late to work and you look over, you got a flat tire. When you're standing in line at the supermarket and you're trying to check out and your debit card gets denied. When you look and you realize that uh, you just don't have any money in your bank account. It's hard to show your rejoicing. It's hard to rejoice always. I mean, when I preach on this text, the reality is a lot of you are thinking, serious chaplain, always? You don't know what I've been through. Maybe some of you have been here and you've faced the lies of your spouse. Your marriage is falling apart. Maybe you found out about infidelity in years gone by or even during your tour here. Maybe you've gotten that bad report from a doctor that you are diagnosed with some type of illness, cancer, or something along those lines. Maybe you have found out that you're losing your career in the Air Force because of some medical situation or you didn't make rank or whatever is taking place in your life. Paul's prescription for the believer who's in the midst of a trial doesn't change no matter the circumstance, no matter what it is. It's always praise the Lord. That's his prescription. He says rejoice in the Lord always. And because he knows it's hard, he says it again. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. In other words, let your good spirit be evident to believers and unbelievers both. The Lord is near. You're not forgotten in the midst of your pain is what he's saying. Do not, an do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer, that's what we talked about last week, if you remember, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, not the peace that mankind can give to you, not the peace that uh, good circumstances can deliver to you, not the peace that a happy relationship can give to you, but the peace that only a divine source can deliver to you, God himself, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts, or as the King James says, it will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Man, the prescription is praise. So how could Paul rejoice when he was locked up? How could he praise when his dream to preach God to the leaders there in Rome was seemingly taken off track? If you know anything about the story of Paul or Saul of Tarsus, as some of you know, you've been to Tarsus, uh, Paul's calling in his life, which seems to be God-led and God-given, was to take the gospel all the way to Rome and to preach the gospel there to Rome, even to Caesar himself. Even though Paul understood that there would be some dangers with this, he understood that his possible imprisonment would be a result of this missionary effort into the heart of the power of the world to, to go to Rome himself, or himself and preach the gospel, Paul was still determined to follow this prompting by God. And as he goes out, he gets in prison, and here he goes. He decides to praise the Lord, and he gives the prescription of praise, even though he's in the penitentiary, right? How is he able to do this? Because it's all about perspective. And so this morning, I want to talk about the perspective of praise. Perspective is something that's very simple, it means just how you see something or how you see circumstances. I don't know if you remember, but when I was back in high school, we used to have these magic... You're way ahead on the slides. You've got to go back. I'm sorry. I'm that hard to follow. Uh, we used to have these magic uh, eye posters. And on those magic eye posters, if you can find it, it's a picture of a poster that is multicolored. There you go. Uh, the magic eye poster... These things were all the rage, and they were all over the place. Nowadays, I don't see them very often, but I remember when I first saw them, people would stand around, and they would look at those posters, 
and they would be standing outside of gift stores or whatever in the middle of the mall, just staring at them. And I would look at them, and I couldn't see anything. And I would always say, you guys are lying. You're lying. You're lying. They'd be like, no, there's dolphins. They're jumping out of the ocean. It's amazing. There's a unicorn with flames. Can you see it? I'm like, you're making stuff up. Like, this is some elaborate hoax on those who don't know it and those that do. And so uh, I was walking around the mall one time, the Aurora Mall. If any of you have been at Buckley Air Force Base, you know where Aurora is, right outside of uh, Buckley there with my friend Curtis. And he walks by one of these posters, and he stops, and he looks at it. He's like, that's pretty cool, man. There's some horses running by some mountains. I'm like, no, there's not. He says, no, there is, seriously. And I'm like, I'm looking at it. I don't see anything. He's like, you've got to look through it, man. Right? If you know how to do these, you've got to look through it. Some of you are trying to see what that says right now. you got to, like, get your eyes to cross. Have anybody ever explained this to you before? You stare at it, you look through it, you get your eyes to cross. Can anybody read what that poster says up there, by the way? Has anybody done it yet? No one yet? Uh, and as he's coaching, it might be hard to do it from this, from this point. I don't know if I can get my eyes to even do it because it's so big. But as I'm standing there and I'm staring and I'm looking through that poster, all of a sudden horses appear and I see the scene that's set before me it was all about perspective I had to look through the image to get my brain to see what was there by the way that says I love you if you can get your eyes to do it from this con from that from 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 the point that you're at our word comes from the Latin root which means to look through when we talk where we get our word our English word perceive to look through a circumstances and to perceive something deeper, to perceive, to see something better. To not get caught up uh, uh, really with just the shell of a matter, but to be able to see through that and to see what God is doing. To move past the fear and the anxiety that might be on the surface of a situation and to adjust our perspective so that we see through it, see what God is doing, and enable our hearts to be able to have a perspective of praise. Sadly, most of us approach the issues that we have in life with a totally different translation of Philippians chapter 1, 12 through 13 than what Paul gives us. We would have the bad perspective version, is what one pastor called it. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me really sucks. God let me down. I'm overwhelmed with anxiety, depression, and hopelessness. And because of all the horrible things that I've been through, I'm quitting church and I'm never going back there again. That's the bad perspective version. You know how many believers I have met that are dwelling in the bad perspective version and rather than Paul's version? They're caught up in all of the bad stuff that has happened to them and all they see is the hurt and harm. They can never look through it and gain the godly perspective of maybe what God is doing. See, there's really two ways to see trials in life. One is the perspective of pain, or two is the perspective of praise. The perspective of pain says, when they look at it, they just say to themselves, oh, my dreams are over now that this has happened to me. I can't overcome the problems that have set up against me is their perspective of pain. Or here's one that's very familiar to us. I'm stuck here and I'll never get out. Feels that way at the lick sometimes, doesn't it? I remember when I sat down with my command chief at my old wing <coughs> he was, uh, that I was assigned to. And uh, we would meet once a, about once a month together, and we were talking. And this guy is like true blue. I mean, the most Air Force guy you would ever meet in your life. And we're sitting there, and he's just, he's one of these guys, a thousand words a minute. Hey there, chaplain, how you doing? Come on into my office. Let's sit down. Let's talk. Let's pray together. Brother, I'm so glad you came in and met with me. Hey, would you like any coffee, chaplain? All right. Now listen, he's quoting the Bible. He's quoting John Maxwell. He's quoting uh, Hap Arnold. He's quoting everything under the sun, right, you know? And this guy's just coming at me, and he says, well, you got your next assignment. I'm excited for you. Where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to uh, Interlake, Turkey. And the first time in ever uh, two or three years knowing this guy, he stops dead in his tracks. No words. He looks at me, and he says, I've done some time at the 39th. 
And I thought, oh boy, what am I in for that this is the one thing that shook this guy to the core. And he referred to it as doing some time at the 39th. Sometimes you might feel like that. Maybe you love it here. I hope you do. Uh, but you might feel like I'm stuck on this base. I cannot escape the lick. I'm just right here doing my time. Listen, you are looking at life from the perspective of pain. You need to change your perspective to see through it and look at it from a perspective of praise. I remember when I just got to go TDY back to Maxwell Air Force, ba Air Force Base, and on the way there, I lost my luggage, you know. In fact, I got on the plane. I don't know if I shared this story. I knew I was going to lose my luggage so much. I was so positive that I was going to lose my luggage that when I got on my first flight from Adana to Istanbul, I started to research how to recover your luggage with uh, uh, Turkish Airlines. I was like, I better know what I got to do because they're going to lose my luggage. There's no way these people are going to pull this off. Sure enough, I get to my connecting flight in London Heathrow. I asked if my bag get loaded. They said, no, sir, your bag has not made it to the plane. We're sorry, we've lost your luggage. <laughs> and so I was ahead of the game. But in the midst of the whole thing, I get there. I'm going through troubles. I'm going through pains. I am ticked off about the situation. You know, I got one change of clothes and my uniform, and that's it. And I'm trying to get my luggage back, and you can't talk to anybody. Nobody cares, and it's just, you know, it's just out there in the universe. I don't know where. And I'm going back and forth, and I get to Maxwell, and the airport there doesn't have anybody that understands lost luggage because it's such a small airport. It's late at night, so they can't help me. They say, sir, you got to come back in the morning. So the next day, I get in a cab, and it's Sunday, and I'm skipping church. Yeah, but I'm skipping church because I'm going back to the airport to file my lost luggage. So we're driving, and the guy's talking to me, and he says, I've been picking up a lot of chaplains from the airport lately. And I said, oh, I'm a chaplain. He said, you are. And he says, I got a question for you, chaplain. Have you had your devotions today? And I said, no, I haven't. In fact, if anything, I've been cursing the Lord, not praising him. <laughs> and so he starts to talk to me. And, 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 and as we go back and forth, I found out this guy's a brother in Christ. He's retired from the Air Force. He now runs this taxi business there in Maxwell. And, and he says to me, or I say to him, excuse me, I, I said to him, I said, you know what? Maybe the reason why I lost my luggage was so that I could be encouraged by you about my relationship with God. He said, amen, brother, amen, maybe that's why. Perspective. Perspective changes your attitude with how you deal with things and how you see things. See, Paul said in Philippians 1, 12 through 13, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, this is his imprisonment he's talking about, has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. This is a positive perspective. He praises the Lord for what has taken place in his life. I Man, I don't know if you know anybody like this that is just a hyper, you know, loving Jesus type of person. You know, they're always walking around, I'm blessed by the best. He shall never leave me nor forsake me. You know, they're quoting verses. I got a friend like that in the Air Force. In fact, so much so that when I went through officer training school with him, uh, I, I thought he was a chaplain. They asked a chaplain to pray before one of the classes. I said, no, I don't need to do it. Uh, uh, chaplain Brown can do it. And he looked at me and he's like, I'm not a chaplain, I'm a medical officer. <laughs> uh, but he talked about God so much that I assumed he was a chaplain. He just had the right perspective. And here Paul, chained to Roman guards, doesn't look at it as a problem, but rather he looks at it as an opportunity to give the gospel to influential leaders. See, every eight hours, that guard would have to change out. And so for every eight hours, Paul would get a new opportunity to witness about Christ and the work that he had done for them. And he was really getting an opportunity to accomplish his purpose that he had set out to do. He was just doing it in a different way than he had expected. The question is, who was the real prisoner? I bet you some of those guards were thinking, oh my goodness, the Jesus Jew again. I can't deal with this right now as they got locked up to him. 
This wasn't the first time that Paul was in prison. It wasn't the first time that he had been through this trial. In fact, if you go back to Acts chapter 16, verse 22, we'll look at some verses here in a second, but Paul and Silas were going to go worship with some other believers in a home. They were going to really a prayer service, and on their way, a riot breaks out because they knew that Paul and Silas were in the city, and they were preaching Jesus, and uh, this city did not want Paul and Silas in there doing that. So the crowd joins in, in verse 22 of chapter 16, so the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to strip, to be stripped and to be beaten with rods. Imagine if this was what was demanded of you for following Christ. But they are humiliated, their clothes are stripped off, they are beaten, and if the magistrate is ordering it, they are people that are professional punishers that are doing the beating. Uh, uh, with these uh, uh, wooden dowel type of things. Their confidence, I imagine, was tested. Their peace, I imagine, was taken from them. I even doubt that they had joy at that moment because they had been beaten down. I would imagine that Paul and, and Silas, as they went through this, were facing discouragement, doubt, and worries. Here they were serving God, and because of it, they've been severely flogged, humiliated, and thrown into prison. Bloody, bruised, black-eyed, embarrassed, broken nose, possibly broken ribs, on a cold, hard prison floor, wrongly accused, and violently beaten. What is their solution to the situation? And woe is me, Lord. It's not what they do. Instead, in verse 25 of chapter 16, it says this, At about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Their perspective was praise. In the midst of something that I don't think I could ever tolerate or handle, they decide to praise the Lord praising God while they were in prison. Now notice, they weren't praising, for, praising God for what he had done. They were praising God for who he was. I want you to get this. Because everybody in this room this morning will go through some type of trial in your life. It may be for your faith, it may be a health issue, it may be your marriage, it may be with your children, it may be financial, it may be with your parents, it may be whatever it is, everybody will go through a trial. And if your relationship is dictated and dominated, that you only are thankful to God when he does that what you like him to do, or that what you want him to do, then my friend, it will be impossible for you to praise him in the midst of the storm. But if your relationship is based upon who God is, and you understand and you know God, and you know who He is, you know that He's good, you know that He is loving, you know that He is graceful, you know that He is merciful, you know that He is kind, you know that He is near to the brokenhearted. In the midst of your trials, your pain, your suffering, whatever it is that you're going through, you'll be able to have the perspective of praise. You'll be able to say, Lord, I thank you in the midst of the valley. I praise you in the midst of the storm because you praise him for who God is. My friend, I, I would ask you this just in passing here in the message. Do you follow God for what he can give you or do you follow God for who he is? Praise God for who he is. Notice they praise him even before the provision comes. Before the provision comes, before the deliverance comes, Paul and Silas are singing praises to God. Now here's the spoiler alert. That during the middle of this worship service that all the other prisoners are listening to, an earthquake is sent, right? You should go back and read Acts 16 this afternoon if you've never read it before. It's an awesome story. An earthquake is sent and the doors are open and the chains are shaken loose from Paul and Silas. And they're able to walk free. 
fact, there's a jailer that's sitting there that's about to kill himself because he knows he's going to be put to death for letting the prisoners go free. But Paul and Silas look around. They say, don't kill yourself. We're all still here. And the man says, what must I do to be saved? He ends up coming to Christ, and his whole family ends up coming to Christ because of this miracle. See, now, listen, why does this matter so much? Why does the story back in the book of Acts matter for what we're looking at in the book of Philippians? Because the reality is this. Paul had already experienced the miraculous deliverance of God while he was imprisoned. And he is writing this book of Philippians while he is imprisoned. And despite there being no sign of deliverance, he is still commanding the Philippian church to praise God in the midst of their troubles. He is still saying rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. He knew that God could deliver him. He understood that God wasn't going to deliver him. And he still said, rejoice. The reality is he was saying, I'm going to praise God when he delivers me, and I'm going to praise God when he doesn't. What a lesson for us to take. He goes on in verse 25, and it says this, And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praising and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to him. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake, and the foundations of prison were shaken, and all at once... The prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Now, can you visualize that moment? Midnight in a prison. Every time they move, their body is racked with pain. Paul says, Psst, Silas, yeah, you awake? Praise the Lord together. I need encouragement. You two guys start singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to the Lord. In the darkness, there's probably some cranky curmudgeon in an unreal other cell. Shut up! I'm trying to sleep. Maybe they say, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. The prison begins to shake. The walls fall. The chains are loosed. Some of you this morning are imprisoned by worry, anxiety, and fear in your life. In your darkness, you just need to praise the Lord. You need to see through it. Say, God, I don't know what's going on, but I know who you are. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I know you are a good God. And I will rejoice. So in closing this morning, I encourage you to praise the Lord with your lips. You say, hey, when I sing, it doesn't come out very pretty. It's okay. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. You're singing to an audience of one. Praise the Lord. There is in power in God's, or in God, when God's people praise. Let's close in a word of prayer, and we'll worship the Lord together in our closing song. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, I don't know what the different needs are that are, that are represented here this morning. Uh, some folks here this morning may not have a relationship with the Lord and they need to accept the fact that they have sinned and believe that Christ died on the cross for their sins and was buried and rose again and call upon you to be their Lord and Savior. And Lord, I pray if that's the case, I pray that today will be their day of salvation, whether it's even during this time of invitation that they simply confess, Lord, I'm a sinner. I've broken the word of God. I, I'm guilty before you. I'm worthy of separation from you and death and hell will be my reality without you because of my sin. The quietness of this moment, Lord, maybe they'll confess that. Say, Lord, I, I believe you were God, that you died on the cross for my sins, that you were buried and you rose again. Come into my life, be my Lord and be my Savior. Pray that prayer and find your relationship. But for those that are believers this morning that are facing anxiety, Lord, I pray that you give them the grace, that you give them the strength, that you give them the vision to see.
see through the pain and have a perspective of praise. That they might praise you not for what you have done, but for who you are. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together this morning and lift our voices to the Lord. In closing, then we'll have a benediction for dismissal. Let's pray some together.
Jesus. Have a blessed week.